What's going on everyone? Justin again, as always, thanks for watching my channel. Welcome back. Cheers to those of you that have your beers. I hope you're enjoying the beginning of your work week so far. It is Monday, right? Trying to kick it off with a good note. But we did have a shop meeting today. And we're gonna discuss what I believe is one of the hardest parts about being a dealership tech. But before we get into today's story, please make sure to smash the thumbs up button. We really appreciate it as our content does take a good portion of my time to do. And I'm gonna get into storytelling mode because like my buddy Nick Morello from JDT Co, come for the price, stay for the show, right? So we got a show today, we got a little discussion topic that I wanna go in a little bit more detail and the hardest part about being a dealership tech this is going to be a wild one for you guys, but it's going to be storytelling 101, okay? We're going to cover some ins and outs of why it's so difficult to tell a story. Because you have to tell a story. You almost have to be a novelist. See, I always considered myself more like uh, Dr. Seuss and not so much Edgar Allan Poe, right? It's not always fluent and precise and doesn't always come out clean. Mine's more colorful, lots of pictures, right? So... There's a, there's, there's a certain tact that you have to have when you're creating your final story on the repair or when you're getting ready to submit your story for your initial diag. We're gonna go into some of the details on some things that I've done that I have been successful with and some things that I have done that I've not been successful with. And I'm, I'm having some trouble telling stories. And believe it or not, I'm a hell of a storyteller. So you'd think that I'd have this part down pat, but it's not that easy. We're gonna go into more detail about it. I want to give a huge shout out to today to Felipe Perez. We bought a couple more of his beautiful, beautiful photography artwork. Okay, this one happens to be a, some kind of Ford rat rod. This thing looks freaking sick, dude. Love it. Right next to the fire department, it's gonna look good on the wall. Kind of running out of wall space, Felipe. But uh, I'm gonna move all this stuff out to storage eventually. I just need time to catch up on, and it's it's hard to catch up on stuff when you uh, when you appear. Another Perez special, what the Nissan Skyline, huh? This thing, man, just kind of had Fast and Furious written all over. Plus, I love the color blue. So, to get a shot like this, the guy has got an artistic eye for sure. I, I love this picture, man. This picture looks great, and I'm I'm a Pretty big fan of the Nissan Skyline myself. Now, I don't own any, okay? I've never bought uh, a Nissan Skyline. I've owned a POS Sentra or two, uh, but I don't think I've ever owned a Skyline. But I think the car looks sick overall, and I love his style of photography. It almost looks like he's out of shop. So, gotta give it up to Perez on this one. All right, let's talk about the storytelling thing. So, the car comes in, customers, original concern is that maybe the mill lamp is on uh, followed by a 23 point you see it's not just diagnostic stories your 23 point has to have a story behind it too believe it or not so even as a lube tech you're like well man i'm not in diagnostics i just do the r and r and inspections i'm good but are you though we're going to talk about some of these things that maybe you should consider doing in your future storytelling uh process okay because some of these things we covered today one of them uh, outside of just slashing the green block there sometimes there's a fluid level little percentage deal on the side and it's it'd be who of you to at least check the level or the, where the level currently is and the condition so the bubbles is not just like it's green level and condition it's like the bubbles that they have off to the left is more for condition purposes and the fluid level itself is off to the right, so you can annotate where the level was when it came in. This is important when it comes down to like lube oil filter services, right? We've discussed that too on older cars, there's Zerk fittings, so it's more than just changing the engine oil and the engine oil filter. You have Zerk fittings on suspension components that require regreasing. Same thing with drive shafts. Okay, so you have those things that you have to annotate. So when you're putting in your notes for lube oil filter, uh, you know, changed engine oil and filter, lubricated uh, outer tie rods, drag link, pitman arm, the ones that had the Zerg fittings, uh, as as customer request. Okay, so you're doing the lube, you're doing the oil, and you're doing the filter. So that's good. How about verified fluid level after vehicle startup? Here's something that some techs might skip, or some beginner lube techs might skip, but it's important that once you get done filling it up 
to verify that the fluid level is still good even after engine startup because some of these fluid capacity specifications they give you they're a little bit off or sometimes as you're pumping it into the container to dump it in sometimes it's a little bit off so it might look like it's four and a half but you might be just under you might need to add like an additional uh, 200 milliliters or possibly you know a half a quart depending on what the fluid level look like after vehicle startup so there's that storytelling process is what's going to cover you the second portion of this is road testing it when it's complete some dealerships or independent shops will have a two to three mile radius then a five to eight mile radius then a 10 to 20 mile radius depending on what it is that you did for the repair or if it was just a quick service okay, let's talk about fluid condition so brake fluid typically clear can turn an oily greenish or dark brown color okay and that that means that something had gotten in there which contaminated it or it got so hot it has now changed uh, the, the chemical properties or the chemical makeup of that fluid. Here's another thing to consider, boiling point. So when you have this uh, dot three fluid in the hydraulic system for the braking system, as it gets hot, it pulls away certain properties and then becomes more H2O. So then you might have more water in it than you have actual dot three. So then you can go off a of fluid condition based on how much water was found. Because once it reaches a certain boiling point, it like has this humidity factor. And what happens in a boiling kettle of pot, water goes on top, get moisture, falls back down, and eventually lowers the level and dries out. Well, it's not like you're losing fluid by it burning up, but it will turn into more water than the actual chemical property. Look, I don't know all the makeup, I'm just giving you my little scientific hypothesis behind how all this stuff changes on the fly. Transmission fluid, okay, it can be burnt. You can have that burnt smell. We got, most of you guys get that part. Engine oil, really hard to, to tell whether they were at a thousand miles or 3000 miles because sometimes you can pour fresh engine oil in and it's a little bit lighter in color than it was when it originally came in based on mileage, right? So you can't always go by color and the sticker's not always present. And not every vehicle has a percentage indicator or how much oil life is left. And this also would go into resets. So as you're putting in your notes, make sure to tell them that you reset it. Setting tire pressure, that's one of those big things. That's gotta be in your story too, to kind of cover your butt, right? Set tire pressure to 36 PSI as per manufacturer specification. Now let's go over into like this mill lamp thing. So customer complaint comes in, check engine lights on. I had a doozy today. Customer states, check engine lights on, and the oil reset life is on, and the tire pressure is on. Okay, so the, the couple of easy ones right there, right? So check the tire pressure, okay, found screw, one tire was low, that took care of that. Oh, there's no sticker in the window, oil looks dark, they're probably due for service, that's why the service engine oil life is on, okay, because they've reached their, their um, maximum duration of before they need to get it changed again but then go one step further i pulled the dipstick out and it was barely on the dipstick so i had to make a note engine oil barely on dipstick so if the engine light that came on was a misfire or any kind of cranking issue or something like that or some kind of camshaft issue or it had an oil um sensor kind of leveling issue look there there's a there's a, there's a thing with the, t with the two point, okay. This is so hard to like tell everything all at once. You know, talking about storytelling, 101, really difficult. Uh, the 2.4 multi-air engine that Chrysler made has an oil consumption issue. They also have a PCM flash update that is available on some makes and models. And with that flash update, it tells you to check the oil level. And then before performing the flash, they recommend doing the complete service and then having them come back within so many miles to recheck the oil level to see if it falls within manufacturer specification. So there's multiple things that can lead up to this one thing. So you don't just want to blow through the oil change, then check the check engine light, you see. So it's this process of elimination of information and trying to depict what to do first. Obviously, the, the easiest thing to do first is to do your inspection. Get the form submitted so that way the writer has it 
available, but let the writer know you have not gone through with the diagnostic portion yet. So there may be an addition to the multi-point up and coming. This way, the service writer doesn't get overzealous and run off to the customer and start trying to sell them all the things that you saw that was wrong because you still have not figured out what their root cause or their main problem is for the one thing they originally came in for. The 23 point is like an addition to, but it could help you to figure out the issue. So if a customer comes in, says they have a clunking coming from the front end and you're doing your 23 point, you notice that the ball joints are blasted or the wheel bearings blasted or the tie rods blasted, okay, that kind of can fall more like in a diagnostic slash inspection point, right? Customer complaints, check engine lights on for throttle position sensor. And you pop the hood open to get ready to do your 23 and you notice that the wiring can, uh, pigtail going to the throttle body is chomped in half by rodents. Hey, look, it, that was like maybe an easy find or at least that's the beginning or a possible cause of their problem. Let's try to fix this connection first, clear codes and see if the problem comes back. You see, so how, how your inspection can help you out with diagnostics. The problem that I've been running into, and like I said, this is the hardest part about being a dealership tech, is that you also have to put in your own labor time requests for various things that you are uh, at being asked to diagnose. So as you're diagnosing the check engine light, like this one today, I had to go a few steps further and you know, the customer paid for the one hour, but I really gave him about four hours of my time because there was so much going on with this vehicle. So I did my 23 point and there was so much to annotate 23 point wise between their struts, the radiator was leaking, right? The, the uh, radiator cap was not holding pressure. I had to pressure test it. I had codes that showed that there was a circuit low for the electronic coolant temp sensor. So I've got that. Plus I had to add a half a gallon of water to their radiator in order to do a pressure test. There was rodent uh, debris all over the intake area which means that probably underneath the wires got chewed going to it because now I've got a shorted code and it gets a little bit better because they also had a, um, a small evap leak issue on top of that and a hooded jar issue on top of that, all in their stored codes. Now obviously the hooded jar is not gonna cause the check engine light to come on, but it will throw a code, but the electronic coolant temp sensor being chewed on would the small evap leak definitely would. So I've got two different issues in the underlining of a one hour diag. So look, between the inspection and the diag, I, I put forth probably about three or four hours into this thing between inspecting it. And my story was really, really good, but it was a novel of stuff. And then still being unfamiliar with uh, really looking up my own labor times as far as how much the book says to do per job and then trying to categorize and separate those in between each other for different underlining issues it just seemed like it took me about an hour out of that three to four hour window it took me at least an hour to write all these notes look up all the labor times then i had to look up certain parts to figure out what the actual name was because i was unfamiliar with a couple of them and it was just like okay what do I do, right? So I'm, I'm putting in all these notes, putting in all this time, and you know, I don't know if the job is sold or not, that's not up to me at that point, but it was trying to cover my own ass, right? Now look, I'm not perfect by any means, okay? This is me still trying to figure it out, and I can tell you that uh, when I'm doing used cars, I'm trying to get them done in a pretty proficient manner while moving with a purpose. And there are certain things that might not catch my eye right away or that didn't seem like they were going to be big deals because I'm like, eh, maybe the detailing, you know, side can handle this little tiny scratch. It doesn't seem like it's anything real big. I don't know if that's really worth annotating, but it was. Uh, the rim has a little tiny, you know, marking, marring on it from curb rub. You know, is that really going to be an issue? It is a used car. Like, I, I'm, I'm trying to think exactly like how they want it to be. But yes, they, they want everything documented and, and analyzed 
down to the T, which is what they're paying you for, but it's, sometimes I'm just like, well, dude, I just, on some things, I just don't know how far to go. I'm like, okay, so there was a, a, a I think this is a week or two back, the, there was aftermarket lights all around this Jeep. They had a light bar in front, they had a light bar on the roof, they had two of these little ones on top of the hood, they had some in the back, right? And then like none of them worked. Well, there was a fuse that was burnt out and I didn't go checking fuses because I said, well, we're not diagnosing it. I'm just supposed to acknowledge the fact that they don't work and I'm annotating it. But because of how much the dealership is paying you to check it out, it's like, well, just, do a couple of extra steps. So I went through, we found that the fuse was burnt out. We replaced the fuse. A couple of them would come on, but they were wired incorrectly into the Jeep. And so there was an intermittent issue as well in the switching board that the customer had done because he did it himself and it did not pan out very well. So that ate up some time. Then there was the, uh, the washer fluid squirters, so the hose going all the way to was fine and disconnected it. Some fluid came out, suspected a possibly clogged screen or something like that, but cannot condemn it till you pull it out. And it's in a little bit of a pain in the butt spot. And again, it's like, okay, well, we can yank that out and look at it. And that's a little extra time. And it's okay if, that, if that's what's supposed to be covered, you know, during the used car inspection, then okay, absolutely, I'll start digging in a little bit deeper, but it wasn't my past experience to, to dig that deep into it. It was like, hey, look, squirters ain't working like they should, annotate it. Lights ain't working like they should, annotate it. So I'm going through, I'm checking the bottom, checking the fluid levels. Okay, fluid levels a little bit low on this one thing. Topped off, pressure tested, everything's holding pressure just a little bit low on the reservoir. So you're imitating all this stuff, tires are good, here's the date code, here's how old they are. But at the end of the day, it wasn't enough. There's still a little bit more information that they would like to know. So that way the dealership knows what they have to do in order to get this car lock ready. Because they don't want to just stick it on there and still have these issues because then that makes us look bad. So it's like, I have some changing to do. I've got to change the way that I perceive things because it's like, well, okay, I, I, I do get it and I do understand. And yes, you know, the how much they're paying for this inspection makes total sense. But to, at, to what extent? Like how much additional time would you like me to put forth? Because there are some moments, like if we rewind previous in this conversation, I know this conversation is dragging out, but listen. Let's go back to the 23 point in the check engine light. So I spent three or four hours on that for a one hour job. But that could have potentially led to a three or $4,000 ticket. The consensus that I now have about the used cars is to put forth the same amount of effort when it comes to the used cars as I did a customer car um, that's not paying it for a potential upsell to the dealership. And in reality, it's far easier to sell the jobs onto the dealership than it is to a customer because, you know, it's like my shop manager had said earlier today, not everybody can afford to come in and just do a $3,000 worth of repairs. Not everybody is saving money every single paycheck. This is something that I've been kind of encouraging you guys along the way throughout this entire journey of YouTube to do is to at least take something, something from your paycheck and put it to the side each and every single payday. And it doesn't have to be half your stack, okay? Start off small. Maybe do like a, maybe, maybe challenge yourself to a hundred bucks a month in the beginning, okay? That might still seem a little bit high to some people, uh, but if you could challenge yourself to a hundred dollars a month in savings and do that for three months, if you found yourself developing new habits as a result and you can increase that to maybe 200 a month and try that for two or three months, 
And the reason why I say three months really is because the, it, it has been statistically proven that it takes anywhere between 60 and 90 days to formulate a habit. And that's the fact, Jack. When it comes to smoking, cigarettes, or drinking, or eating candy, or eating fast food, it'll take you 60 to 90 days to train yourself to not do that every single day or every other day to create newer and healthier habits. This is a healthy habit, but you, I'm not saying you have to get rid of your vices in order to do it. All I'm saying is develop this one good habit to go with your bad habits, if that makes sense. Because I don't know what your bad habit is. Your bad habit is that you get on the damn tool truck and you spend 200 bucks a week. Okay, that's not unforeseeable for some mechanics. I've seen some of y'all jump on the truck. Shit, even today, okay, I spent 80 bucks on two photos. And then I spent another $3 on a monster. Did I need to spend $83 today? No, I like these pictures, they looked good. And it's supporting a local. I chose to, this is a choice. I don't need to do this every single week. I'm not gonna do it every single week. That, that's not really a habit. It would be a habit if I was buying them each and every single week for you know 60 to 90 days, but I'm not doing that, okay? I'm buying a handful of pictures that I wanna hang up on my wall. We're getting pretty close to the finish line. You guys probably gonna have some more artwork. So I look forward to at least seeing it, but eventually I'll have some of this blank wall covered up with some pretty cool pictures, I think. But at any rate, do me that favor, okay? Just try it out. Try it out. 60 to 90 days. Start trying to formulate a new habit. Formulate a new habit with saving some money. Try to formulate a new habit with getting better at storytelling and putting in your notes uh, so that way it covers your ass because, man, this could lead to something ugly too because if you're not covering your own ass and you're not putting your notes in, I just found out today that your ass could go to jail because uh, you know you could have potentially uh, caused somebody their you could you could have cost somebody their life, right? Because you're a professional mechanic, you said they were good, really they weren't good, and that one component fails and they die. Now you're doing ten years for life. It's not a good time, man. Let that sink in for a minute. Shit, right? So this is a this job is not as easy as everyone makes it out to be okay i'm sure turning a wrench in the driveway is fun from time to time so long as it's on your own rig uh, but i'm sure even most of you have had mechanical nightmares where you go to sleep and you wake up and go shit did i did i tighten that one thing those nightmares will always be with every mechanic i don't care who you are and uh we're it's just something that's going to happen to you I've had them. I'm sure you guys have had them. I've heard other people tell me that they've there was a couple of things that they had to go back and recheck the next day. So let that sink in for a minute. Cheers to those of you that have your beers. We'll see you guys next video. Deuces.